Hey folks, Michael here, and in this video we are talking about that oh-so-delicious and dangerous addition to the modern lifestyle, sugar. Now I say modern because sugar as we know it is relatively new on the human seeing. <laughs> seeing? Human scene. Refined starting about 2,500 years ago in Asia, it was still considered exotic, rare, and expensive up until about 800 years ago, and has only been consumed on a mass scale for about 400 years. And while humans generally rely on sugar and glucose metabolism for their energy needs, pre-modern people got their glucose from whole versions of carbohydrate-rich sources, seasonal fruits, as well as roots and other edible plants. Much of their energy may have been derived from the fats that came along with eating meat, but even as far as their sugar intake was concerned, this was a type and amount that our body has the bandwidth to process in a, into a steady form of energy to power our daily physical and mental activity. Now in the year 2000 in the United States, average sugar consumption was nearly 70 kilograms per person. That's almost 150 pounds. Now compare that to the two kilograms per year in modern hunter-gatherers that we use to compare to what our diets might have been like in prehistory. And the honey that's responsible for most of their intake would only have been available seasonally. Now. What we have available now is like cocaine to the coca leaf. Related, yes, but refined beyond recognition and available in doses and forms that can overwhelm your body's ability to effectively, efficiently, and safely handle it. Our bodies can process and buffer a certain amount of sugar every day. We have metabolic cycles that are designed to handle it. The problem we're facing today is that sugar is so widely available in both obvious and hidden sources that our physiology breaks down in the face of more than we can deal with. What seems normal to us, even when we cut back on sugar, would have still been an enormous amount to a pre-modern human. Now, sugar presents real dangers to our physiology and health, not just because we can only safely and effectively consume so much of it, but because its use has really been over-normalized. We take for granted how much sugar we can consume and how much sugar we do consume, not just in ice cream or candy or soda, but in commercially available products like soups and sauces and dressings and yogurt, even flavored water. Everyday products that are part of regular food consumption contain amounts of sugar that when added up over the course of a day equals half a pound for the average American. On average, we eat far too much of this stuff, but we also have a lack of understanding of its impact on our health. It's not just an inconvenient source of extra calories. It is a potential toxin that triggers hormones and physiological processes that demand resources that weren't meant to handle the load. So let's get into some of the important details and see if we can clear up some of the more common misunderstandings of sugar. How much is in what we eat? what sugar really is, and what it does to our bodies. Now, one of the first things to know is that sugar has many identities. Sugar has more than 50 common names, ranging from the ones you know, sugar, cane sugar, evaporated cane sugar, high fructose corn syrup, to less obvious names like brown rice syrup and fruit juice concentrate, to the frankly obscure, like dietase and galactose. Now, food companies will often divide the sugar in their products into multiple forms, and the result of this is that sugar falls lower and lower on the list of ingredients as those lists are built in the order of the quantity the ingredient is in as a part of the whole. That means that if sugar would have been the first ingredient on the list, if you break it into four or five sugars, each of these might not appear until much further down the list, giving you the impression that sugar occurs in much smaller doses than it actually does. I mean, according to research, sugar has been added to virtually every processed food limiting your ability to avoid it. Approximately 80% of the 6 million consumer packaged foods in the United States have added caloric sweeteners. It's everywhere. It's in just about everything you might buy in a package. It's very difficult to avoid, and the quantities add up as we eat these seemingly innocuous products. There are also forms of sugar that have this good reputation that they really don't deserve. Things like honey, agave, and maple syrup are often thought of as healthy forms of sugar, when in reality, they are as bad or sometimes worse than your standard table sugar. I mean, the argument that honey was available to prehistoric people as a part of their diet overlooks the fact that it was highly seasonal and had to be found and gathered in order to be consumed. And that only compares to us if you consider seasonal to mean all four seasons and gathering to mean throwing a jar into your shopping cart whenever you want it. Sugar is sugar. Whether it's white and granulated or golden and flowing, it's too available and it's all broken down into a single molecule of glucose before it gets into your blood. 
Your body isn't particularly biased about where it comes from. And that is until you consider fructose and agave. Now these are considered in some circles as a more natural form than other forms of sugar. But agave is not only a highly refined source of sugar, it contains more fructose than the vilified high fructose corn syrup. Now try to refrain from imagining as this traditional product where sap is boiled into a syrup-like sweetener. No. Agave nectar is made from the starchy root bulb of the agave plant. The process of converting it to syrup is similar to the process of making corn into high fructose corn syrup. Agave is 70% fructose compared to high fructose corn syrup 55%. Well, why should that matter? Isn't fructose like fruit? Well, yeah and no. Concentrated fructose is not a part of fruit. What you find in fruit is called levulose. It's not only bound to other sugars, but enzymes, vitamins, minerals, fiber, and pectin. Fructose is a refined version, and why is this a problem? Well, for starters, let's talk about where they're processed. Levulose is processed in the intestine, while fructose is processed exclusively in the liver. The sugars that are processed in your intestines enter your bloodstream as glucose and are available for energy. Sugars that are processed in your liver are immediately converted to triglycerides and stored as body fat. And triglycerides are that number that your cardiologist is forever trying to get you to lower. Yes. Fructose and agave are terrible for your cholesterol. And because it doesn't enter your bloodstream, it doesn't raise your insulin levels, and this led people to think it was good for diabetics. Wrong again. Fructose inhibits the hormone that tells your body that you are full, leading you to want to eat more. It not only leads to weight gain, but also to the most dangerous forms of fat, visceral fat. This is the fat that's stored in your abdominal cavity, not belly fat. That is the, it's the fat you don't see surrounds the organs in your abdominal cavity, and it's associated with metabolic diseases like heart disease and diabetes, as well as a worsening of blood sugar control and insulin sensitivity. That is all to say that sugar is sugar, and some of it is even worse than sugar. Sugar is just bad for you. Not just if it's got calories and zero nutritional value, it's bad for you because it makes you fat. It's dangerous because it has addictive properties, and it's actually toxic when consumed in excess. Sugar is leading to obesity, diabetes, and heart disease. Today's children are not expected to live longer than their parents. One in three adults is obese. Sugar, particularly fructose, damages your brain. It affects your sense of feeling full. Sugar makes you hungry longer. It's a part of your behavioral reward system. It stimulates the response to tell you, do that again. It releases dopamine and drives you to eat more to repeat the experience. And the more you activate it, the more you lose control over it. Craving increases and tolerance to sugar decreases. Now that dopamine response that's triggered by sugar is different from the one that's triggered by a healthy meal. A healthy meal will do the same thing, but if you repeat the same meal day in and day out, the dopamine response that was triggered by the novelty of the meal wears off. That response, it's believed, comes from the seeking of variety. We need to eat a variety of foods to get that same dopamine response. Now sugar, on the other hand, does not see the response level off. Sugar will keep rewarding you, much like a drug, like alcohol, like nicotine, like heroin. And this is why some people seem to be hooked on sugar. They're hooked on the reward that eating sugar produces in them. Now, as far as damage is concerned, sugar consumption both taxes your liver and it fires up your pancreas to deliver insulin to deal with the sugar in your blood. More sugar equals more work for the pancreas, and overworking the pancreas leads to insulin resistance, heart disease, liver disease, diabetes, and metabolic disorder. Does this mean we can't eat any sugar? No. A sweet treat every once in a while won't hurt you. Fruit is a perfectly reasonable thing to include in your diet. The dangers of sugar come in large part from the processed food industry. It is an industrial scale problem. We not only include sugars in most processed foods, but we process these sugars into forms that the body barely recognizes. We also make highly refined sugar available for daily consumption. The dangers come from our lack of awareness of where sugar actually resides, or how much sugar is in how much of what we are eating, or how much it controls behavioral mechanisms that encourage more sugar eating, or of how it's processed in the body and how much it taxes our system when we eat it. A little sugar is not going to kill you, but sugar at the level that we're blindly consuming it in our culture is leading to the high rates of preventable diseases and conditions 
like obesity, heart disease, liver disease, and diabetes that all of us see in and around our lives every day. Kind of like a bonfire that's built from sawdust rather than logs creates this instantaneous, fiercely hot, out of control flame that demands a constant addition of fuel to keep the process going. A metabolic process built on refined sugars that are added to our daily food promotes a physiology that not only calls for ever more fuel, but one that can burn out of control and cause damage to our bodies and our health. So enjoy a dessert on a special occasion, but keep a very sharp eye out for the numerous hidden sources of sugar in the foods you buy every day and stay sharply tuned to the signal your brain sends you that are not in your best interest. You know that when you eat a slice of cake or a cookie that you actually don't need another in spite of what your brain is telling you. By learning to control that impulse, you weaken it. You reduce your cravings by not feeding them. And by reading labels and staying aware of all the places sugar can appear, you can dramatically reduce your intake of sugar on a daily and yearly basis. And that is what will not only reduce the danger of sugar in your life, it will lead to a longer and a healthier one. Now, these are some of the myriad dangers of sugar. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Have you been successful at reducing sugar and what's happened for you as a result? All right, that's sugar. Thanks for hanging out and I'll see you next time.